Hello and welcome everyone. I am Mrs. Ranthin and we are going to be starting our new unit taking a look at compounds. So in this unit it's going to be broken up into two parts. In the first we will learn how to name and write formulas and very basically identify what type of substance we're looking at. In the second part of the unit we'll learn more specifically about the different types of bonds um, different types of interactions between particles and how those actually form at the atomic level. Today, we're going to focus on some elemental um, substances like metallic uh, substances, as well as some of the ionic compounds. We will then follow up with a more complex form of ionic compounds, covalent compounds, and acids. Now, to be able to do this effectively, the first thing that we need to be able to do is to determine what type of substance we're looking at. And what we've created for you to help that is a flow chart. Now I know what you're gonna say. Oh my gosh, Mrs. Ramson, that is like crazy busy. Like how can anyone read that? That's just too much going on. And I admit there's a lot going on there, but it's kind of your one-stop shop for everything that we're gonna cover in this naming port part of the unit. So I'm gonna zoom us in so we don't have to be quite so overwhelmed with everything all at once. And we're gonna take a look at kind of this first part here. You'll notice that there are three color codings within the flow chart. Elements are purple, and we see those over here. We have covalent compounds in yellow over here, and our ionic compounds in blue over here. Note that the ionic compounds kind of have the most variety of rules. So with what we're going to learn, we'll have a lot of ionic with a fewer number of elemental or covalent rules. So the first question we really want to ask ourselves is how many elements are in the substance? Just get my pen tool going. So when I'm counting elements, that's gonna help us take a look. Do I have um, one element or more than one? So simply put, if I have a single element, their names are pretty straightforward. I'm pretty much gonna just be looking at the periodic table. All right, so this tool is a little tricky. All right, we're going to erase that. Mm -hmm. Tools in Adobe, not as good for immediate writing. So we're going to kind of talk it through. When we look at the number of atoms, that is the number of particles that make it up. And I can either have a single atom where the name would just be what it is, or something called a diatomic molecule. Di means two, okay? atoms to atoms within the molecule. And there are seven elements that exist this way. We still just call them by their elemental name, even though the molecule has two of them. So we'll take a look at that in examples in a moment. If I have two or more elements, then I'm dealing with a compound. And a compound is gonna be a little bit more complex. To decide what type of compound I have, you'll notice that I care if there is a metal present. If there is a metal, notice that everything under yes is in blue. A metal means I have an ionic compound. If there is no metal in the compound, then I am dealing with the yellow category, the covalent compounds. There's a slight exception that we'll get to specifically within that category, but that won't happen in today's discussion. So our goal is that this chart, if we work our way from top to the set of rules, will allow us to write the name of any substance we will deal with. So within covalent, I care about whether the element hydrogen comes first to determine my rules. Within ionic, I care about how many elements are within the substance, and then I follow some rules within that. So this chart is going to be something that we can come back to consistently to help us kind of simplify or summarize the rules we're going to learn about today. So we'll see this come up, and this will be available for you to use as you're doing your practice. So let's get to it. 
So we mentioned that with single elements, I really just need my name from the periodic table. So when we work with chemical reactions or descriptions of substances, you're going to see them written out in kind of words. So let's say you saw something like oxygen gas. That just means oxygen, the element, except in our flow chart, we saw that oxygen is one of the diatomic molecules. Let's zoom in here a bit. So here, O2 means that if we write the formula of oxygen gas, we have to write O2. Okay, hydrogen gas is the same situation. It is also in my list here. Notice it's H-O-F-B-R-I-N-C-L. So Hofbrinkle is what I often use to remember that. It's just an acronym to help me remember which elements make doubles. And Mrs. Cook has a different one. And I have, I can never remember because I remember Hofbrinkle. So you'll have to talk to Mrs. Cook to get it. And if I remember, I'll write it down at some point within it. But H-O-F-B-R-I-N and C-L are the elements that do this. So the formula for hydrogen gas is H2. Now with the exception of those seven elements, all of the rest of the elements, whether metallic or non-metallic, are going to just be their simple one element. So iron, I take a look at the periodic table. I see, let's zoom in a bit. Close that out, 100. Iron is Fe. So I just write Fe. Calcium, a metal. Over here, CA, I just write CA. So no multiples, no additionals. It's just, it is what it is. Take the symbol from the periodic table. So now let's get into the good stuff. So we want to write the names of binary ionic compounds. So let's take a look at our flow chart quick. What we've gotten to here is we've identified that there is a metal in the compound. And when we counted the elements, we arrived at having two. Binary, by bi, like bicycle, means two. Make that stand out a bit. Two elements. The first element is going to be a metal. Think about reading the periodic table from left to right. The metal comes first and the non-metals come second. These compounds are written the same way. Now within the metal, there are some metals that form single ions, and we'll show that in the examples. There are also some metals that form multiple ions. I want you to notice the ones I have highlighted here within this periodic table screenshot. Some of them on your periodic table have multiple ions listed. Most of those are in the transition metals or kind of post-transition metals. The end of the D block and the start of the P block is right between this line. When you have metals like that, we have to designate in their name which charge the metal has. Otherwise, someone writing the formula wouldn't know which one to use. The chosen designation for that is in Roman numerals. So we'll make sure and write down um, what the Roman numerals mean as we do some examples a little bit later. So write the name of the metal first. Once we determine if it forms multiple ions, we will write the charge of the metal as a Roman numeral. And lastly, we write the name of the non-metal second and we change the ending to IDE. As a rough rule of thumb, when you're changing that ending, the final name of the non-metal should have two syllables. So that'll be a way to decide where to kind of cut off and change that ending. So what better way to do this than to look through some examples? So the first element here I see is CA. So I'm going to go find that on the periodic table. It is right here in this column, in column two. OK, 
okay? This column is the type of metals that form only a single ion. All of them will form plus two charges because they all have two valence electrons and it's easier to give up two than take on six to get to eight. So Ca does not form multiple ions. So I can just write calcium and I do not need any Roman numerals. Next I have N, so I'm gonna go find that on the periodic table. And N is right here as nitrogen. So I am going to take nitrogen. I'm going to take off the ending with my rule of thumb of two syllables. So that would take off the ogen. And then I would have nitride as my ending when I change it to IDE. All right. So let's take a look at the next example, SN. So on my periodic table, I see that SN is one of those that makes multiple ions. So if I need to write down what the charge is on SN, I need to figure out what it is. And I kind of have to work backwards from my anion, my negative ion. So I know it's tin. Okay. When I look at oxygen, it would form a, pull, a negative two ion because it has six valence electrons and it needs two more to get to eight. So now let's go look at our formula. If I have two negative two ions, that means I have a total charge of negative four. If my overall compound is zero, that must mean this is a plus four to be able to cancel out the negative four. We will get to more details on that in the next one where we write formulas. But that means this must be a tin four ion. The charge on the metal is plus four. Then we saw that this is oxygen, so I change it to oxide. That's my two syllable name. So I equals one, I, I equals two, I, I, I equals three, I, B equals four, B equals five, B, I equals six, V, I, I, oops, too many there. Got a little excited, I guess. VII uh, is seven. VIII equals eight. IX equals nine. And X equals 10. That should cover anything that we would possibly need with the ones that I will have you do. Now, in your notes in the right hand column there are some practice ones what i would ask you to do is to take a moment and try a few and then i'm going to put the key up on the next slide it is important you could always come back and view them later try to do them on your own first before you would check the key and just copy them down Notice how I'm spelling fluoride. It's U-O, not O-U, it's not flower. Now, quick little hint on this one. CL makes a negative one ion because it's in column seven. There are three of them, so my overall charge is negative three. That means this must be a plus three to cancel it out. That's why the Roman numeral is plus three. Iron is also one that makes multiple charges. So that's why we had to include the Roman numeral or these last two would have the same name, but they're different formulas. 
So on to formulas. Now this one is gonna be more about identifying the ratio of ions that gets our overall charge to zero. In order to do that, the first thing I need to do is determine the charges on the metal, the cation, and non-metal anion. This will be obvious based on the name either by the column of the metal or non-metal, or the Roman numeral if the metal makes multiple ions. The tricky part then, the mathy part, is to determine the ratio of the elements that will give an overall charge of zero for the formula. So you might hear me say, um, canceling out the charge is another way to say this. But what it really means is the total positive charges should be equal to the total negative charges. We will then write the metal symbol first and that's going to have a subscript indicating the number of atoms. I'll follow up the second symbol with a subscript for the number of atoms. So let's take a look at how we might do this. So I see that I have zinc chloride. We wanna determine our charges first. So if I look at my periodic table, I see zinc right here. It's not in a column that would let me know, but the box tells me that zinc is a plus two and only a plus two. So luckily, this one just has uh, a single type of charge. I like to write the charge above the name because the final formula will not have charges and it's a nice way to keep it out of my final answer where that would be a mistake. The chloride, remember the ending got changed to IDE, is coming from chlorine. It's in column 7A, which is the negative one column, because I only need one more negative electron to get to eight, which is stable. So right now I notice that I have more positive charge than negative charge. I can't have that in the final formula. So I need to figure out the total proportions of each so the charge is equal zero. Well, what I see here is I can multiply negative one times two to get negative two. Two minus two equals zero, which would cancel the charge. So what I would see then is zinc, Zn, would match up with Cl2. There are two Cls needed to cancel the positive two charge in zinc. Let's take a look at the next one. I have nickel three selenide. Now the first thing you wanna notice is that there are Roman numerals. Remember that this is the charge on the metal. So that part's easy. I just need to find the symbol for nickel. And if we check our periodic table, nickel is Ni. So I have an Ni plus three and selenide, I gotta go find that, that came from selen something over on the right, selenium, that's in my negative two column. Now, unlike my example over here, I can't multiply negative two times a whole number and get three. That would be convenient, but it won't work this time. So what I can do is choose a larger number that they are the least common multiples for and set them both equal to the same thing. What if we set them equal to six? So if I could get to plus six and minus six, that would cancel my charge to zero. Well, to do that, I need to multiply the negative two times three, and I need to multiply my positive three times two. That would give me two nickels and three selenides. So my final formula is Ni2Se3. So as I do the next examples, which are in the right-hand side of your notes, we're going to finish this up with a few hints or tricks that might make it easier than just kind of doing the math in your head. Now, the first trick we are going to do is kind of a visual. So I'm gonna draw out symbols for the actual charges. 
Mg, if we look on the periodic table, is in column two, so it would be a plus two. So I'm gonna represent that with two positive charges next to the ion. Sulfur is in column six A, so it's in the negative two. I'm gonna represent that with two negative charges. So my goal, we said, was to have every positive cancel out with a negative. So I'm gonna circle a positive and negative and look to see if there's a pair for each one. In this case, they pair up perfectly. So my final answer would just be MgS. The plus two canceled the minus two. No subscripts needed. Here, potassium is in the plus one column and oxide is in the minus two. We used that one before. If I do it this way, and I make a pair, I'll notice I have a negative left over and I can't have that. So I need to add another K plus. Once I do that, I have a positive for every negative, which means my final answer is K2O. When I look at that here, I would need two positive ones to cancel out a negative two. Now, the other way that we can do this is called the crisscross rule. And one thing we have to keep in mind is that we always have to give it in the reduced form, whatever is the lowest ratio. So here we're being told by the Roman numerals that lead is a plus four. And we know from up here that it's a negative two. I would need two negative twos to cancel out a plus four. So one thing I could think of, the number of the charge becomes how many in a reduced form. So I would come up with PB2O4, but this is not reduced. I can divide both of those by two. That would get me to PBO2. Down here, if I try it, manganese, we're being told, is a plus two. Nitride is a minus three because it's in column 5A. If I crisscross those, I would have three of the MNs and two of the nitrides. Well, let's check our math. Three times positive two is positive six. Negative three times two is negative six. This cancels out to zero. So when in doubt, in most cases, it'll work like this, where if you take the charge of one, it becomes the subscript of the other element. Just make sure that you reduce in a situation like lead four oxide, where you get something that is divisible by a number. So big rule, always give the lowest ratio of the formula. Following this video, you will have an opportunity to practice for binary ionic compounds, both formula writing and um, naming.